Hello everyone, my name is Daniel and I'm a programmer and an artist. Once again, I've been busy this week working on other things, but I have another weekend experiment uh, using simulation nodes. So I'm just, as I just go through my process of experimenting and trying to figure out what I can do with it and come up with cool little tricks and stuff. And um, this experiment was definitely someone inspired by Sebastian Lugu, I think that's how you pronounce it, in his Coding Adventure series. If you haven't seen that, you should check it out. There's some really cool things he's done. But he made a video a while ago about simulating ants and molds and stuff, and for some reason I was thinking about how you, that could be possible in Blender, and so I've come up with this node setup. But in any case, sort of the technique I was experimenting with was could you have sort of a map, some geometry that was just in memory to hold some values to help guide a second geometry. Um, so the original idea was to have these objects sort of moving around and following each other. But in the end, I thought seeing the map was actually a more interesting visual than the objects moving around. Although you can still see the individual agents moving around if you look at this viewer with the points. Anyway, there are still two separate geometries being simulated here. The one's the grid that stays the same. And the score value on those points gets updated every frame. And then, and then the second is these agents, or these points that get animated moving around, and they're trying to follow the hot trails on the map by reading the score value from it, and then moving towards the hotter values, if that makes sense. So here, if we turn the randomness down, you can see them really fall into some paths that are set. Um, and another thing that's really cool about it is I've made it so that it tiles. So if they go off one side, they enter on the other side. And what that means is you can actually render it out as a texture, and then the texture tiles seamlessly forever. So that's kind of a cool side effect. If we go back to the beginning here, I have two ways to start it. One is this circular one where they all expand out from the center. So that's pretty cool. Um, you can also start them with a random point, and that looks like this. Then I've added a bunch of different controls to sort of regulate how they're allowed to move. So one thing we can do is we can add some randomness to the direction they head in. And if you do that, then the and if you do that, then some of them get forced out of the beaten path to, and find new ones, which makes more detailed patterns. Then the sensor response controls their ability to steer towards that. So if you turn the sensor response all the way down, even though they might find somewhere they want to go they won't be able to turn themselves enough to get to it. And that also has the effect of sort of creating a lot of randomness. And then if you turn the sensor response really far up, then they'll be able to turn on a dime and, you know, really make tight shapes. Then you can also control how far in the direction they're heading they're able to search. Um, so I have it set at point 0.2. If you make it closer, if you make the search distance less, then they have less time to react and steer towards the high score location that they found. Um, so that has a similar effect to increasing the randomness or decreasing the sensor response. And then if you make the search distance too large, it sort of affects the scale of the whole simulation. If we make this one, then the shapes we'll get will turn a lot larger. And then the final controls have to do with the agent speed. So you can make them much slower. So you can control the overall speed. We can make them much slower, or we can make them really fast. Um, if you make them too fast, then you can see there's no subframe sampling, so they turn into sort of dotted lines. Um, so you got to be careful about that. You probably also have to play with the speed in relation to the search distance. Um, if you make your speed greater than the search distance, then you're going to jump ahead of where you were looking. So that could have adverse effects. And then the speed variance is the percentage of the speed that the agent speed can be modified by. So essentially, some if you set it to 1, then some agents could move at 0, and some agents could move at double their speed. Um, so that just allows you to have some of them move at different speeds, which, honestly, I don't know that that has much of a visual effect on it. All right, so let's go ahead and go through the nodes, and I'll try to explain sort of what they do and how they work. First of all, I guess I'll just point out some different parts of the graph. So over here, we have the input. 
That's where we generate this grid of points where we're saving all of the score values and we generate the points that are being animated moving around to sort of draw on it. So we sort of generate our first frame over there. Then we have this node here, which is the blur node, and it essentially causes the trails to disperse over time and fade out. Then up here we have the sensors for each agent or point that's being animated moving around. Each agent has four sensors that look in slightly different directions in the direction that they're heading, and then read the value off of the map, the score value off the map at those points, compare them to figure out which one is the hottest or has the highest score, and then we select the direction that matches the highest score. And that's going to be the direction that's used to update the velocity of that agent. Then down here, we take the velocity of the agent, we update it by steering it towards the selected sensors location, and we also add the random value and then adjust it to make sure it moves at whatever speed we selected. And then finally here at the end, we write the current location of all of the agents to the map, increasing the score where the agents currently are. And then after that, we simply set the material to be able to display it. We'll start with the inputs here. Um, the map, what we're seeing right now, is just this grid. It's a 10 meter by 10 meter grid, and you can pick what resolution you want. If you increase the resolution, then it runs slower, obviously. Then here we have a mesh line that's just a single point, and then I'm going to duplicate that times the number of agents we want. So I have that set to 1,000 right now. Um, you can play with different values. Then I have two different ways you could start. One is you just take those duplicated points that are at zero, zero, and start with them there. That's the center start. You can plug that into agents if you want. Or you can give them all a random position that's just in the negative five to five range. So they'll start somewhere on the map. And you can plug that into the start. So that's generated for the very first frame. And then after that, everything goes into this simulation loop and where it feeds back on itself. One thing to note that I haven't seen documented anywhere, and it took me forever to figure out why my thing was working and then suddenly stopped working. If you have multiple geometries going into a simulation input, then the attributes, so like the score and the velocity or attributes, will be applied to the geometry that's next above them. So if you put agents above scores, then the scores no longer apply to the map. They apply to the agents. Um, so I didn't know that was how that worked, and it took me a long time to figure out why my thing suddenly stopped working. So right now, scores is applied to the map, and velocity is applied to the agents. If you put scores below agents, the whole thing stops working because now scores is on agents instead of map. I feel like that should be made a little bit clearer, but that's how it seems to work. All right, so then the first node we have in the loop is this blur node, and it's responsible for updating the map from the previous frame. And what we want to do is we want to decrease the heat or the score everywhere so that we don't, if we don't decrease the heat at all, then the agents will be adding heat in, but we're never taking any out, so everything will eventually just turn white. So we don't want to do that. Um, we want to, where there isn't an agent currently, we need to cool it down. And then um, we also can have that heat spread out so that as time passes from when an agent passed through, the space um, which contains some heat will widen, allowing more agents to be able to find it. So I called that node blur, and it has some controls to adjust how fast the heat spreads and how quickly it decays or cools down after an agent has passed by. So to do that, the first thing we need to do is we need to for a particular point, say this is a point, we need to look at all of its neighbors. So that would be these points. So we'll end up with a total of five values, the value of the point that we are, the value of the point above us, the value of the point below us, to the left and to the right. So here we sample our own value. That's just sample index at index. And then I have a sample adjacent node um, that I don't think ended up using anywhere else, but you pass the index into it and then it samples all of the neighbors. So the way we find the values for the adjacent points is we use four sample index nodes, and the indexes we want to sample are plus one, minus one, plus one row, and minus one row. So we get the size of a row from the side in input, and that matches our resolution, or outside of it's connected to the resolution. And then we want to make it all wrap, so we take for each 
row that we're doing, where we're adding one, we modulo it by the size, so that if we go beyond the size, we wrap back to the beginning. And then if we're looking in the negative direction, same thing. But here we were adding a whole row, so in this case 256, we want to do the modulo by 256 squared. So that if we go beyond the size of our entire array, we loop back to the beginning, if that makes sense. So then once we have those four indices, we simply sample the indexes and output the values. So A, B are negative Y, positive Y, and C, D are negative X, positive X. Now once we have those four values to blur it, all we have to do is add them all together. So we add those two and add those two, add the sum of those two, and then divide it by four to get the average of the four neighbors. And then the spread speed basically lerps the value the average value of all the neighbors with the current value of that point, of the origin point. So if you set the spread speed to 0.5, it would be the average of the neighbors and the origin point. And then as you turn the spread speed down, the, the amount of the neighbors that's included in the result is less. So the origin itself will have a stronger impact on the result than its neighbors. And then to cool everything off, we have this decay speed, which we're just using to pull some of the heat out of the values. Once we've blurred the map from the previous frame, we can take the result of that up here and we can sample it with all of our sensors for our agents that are moving around. So the way we do that is we first have to calculate the point we want to sample at, and that is based on the direction that that agent is currently moving in. So the way we figure that out is we take the velocity of the agent from the previous frame, and I normalize it just to make things easier to calculate. So the length of that vector is one, no matter what speed you're moving at now. And then we can scale it by our search distance. So the larger you make the search distance value, the further ahead it will sample at. Then we take that scaled velocity vector and plug it into four vector rotate nodes. And those will be the four points in front of it that will be sampled to determine where to go. Now you could just plug that straight into the vector rotate and pick some angles. Um, that would probably be fine. What I'm doing here is I'm actually changing the angle that's sampled every frame to be a different random one in a range. Probably not necessary, but that's how I did it. So what I have here is I have the scene time as a frame. I'm just adding a different value to all of those and plugging those into the seed of four different random value nodes. So every frame, it'll, the random value will get a different seed and pick a different result for every point. And then those values are just in ranges. So from these two middle ones look more ahead and these two outer ones look more to the outside, or have more of an angle. So this is negative 0.25 to negative 0.5, 0 to negative 0 0.25, 0 to 0 0.25, 0 0.25 to 0 0.5. And that's in radians, obviously, so I don't even know exactly what those angles are. But somewhere in, I think, like a 45 degree cone in front, something like that. Having picked our four sensor points to sample at, um, we're going to go into these node groups that are named node group. We'll call them sensor sample instead. So what we're going to do is we're going to take the direction that we're sampling in and add that to our position. So we have position add the vector. And then we want to wrap that position so that if we moved our, or if we're trying to sample off the edge of the map, we're going to wrap around and sample on the other side of the map. Um, this wrap position node, all it does is we add 15 because the size of our grid is 10 by 10. So if we add 5, that shifts us over so the bottom left corner would be at 0, 0. But then if we were looking in a negative direction, we could still end up with a negative value. So I add 10 more so that the bottom left corner is at 10, 10. And then we just do modulo 10, which will put everything in the range of 0 to 10. And then we just add 5, or subtract 5 rather, so that the bottom left corner is at negative 5, negative 5, putting the center at 0 again. So all we're doing is shifting something that moves off the edge on the right over to the left. Once we have the wrapped position we want to sample, we simply sample the nearest point on our, off of our map, and that gets us an index, and then we can sample that index for our score value and output the score value. Once we have those four samples, we just have to compare and figure out which one is the greatest. So, so here we compare these two, take the vector of the one that's larger. Then here we compare these two, take the vector of the one that's larger. Here we take the maximum of the, of the two scores, 
and compare the two maximums, and then we take the larger vector of those two. So we go from four values down to one, taking the largest one. Then we scale that vector by the sensor response value. So that affects the agent's ability to move towards its desired location. We add that to our current velocity. Then here we have a random value, negative one to one. And we scale that by the randomness amount. We add that to the result. Then we normalize it. So the length of the velocity is one again. And then we scale that by the agent's speed, which is all of these nodes are just because to multiply things by 0.1 or divide it by 100 or something because the values you need to pick are really small and it's easier if the values on the control panel are like between a 0 to 1 range or something sensible. So these are just converting from 0 to 1 down to a really small number. So here we just have the agent speed scaled down so that's in a reasonable range. We multiply that by the scale va variance, multiply that by negative 1, put that into a random value. Then we take the agent speed, multiply it by 0.1 again, so it's in a reasonable range, and then add our random variance amount to that and set that as a scale of the vector that we normalized so that the speed is consistent for whatever that agent's speed value is. Then we just update the position of all of the agents by adding an offset, um, which is that velocity. And then we take that same velocity and output it to our velocity for the next frame. Then once we have set the position, they might have moved off the edge. So we just take the position, wrap the position. So if they did move off the edge, we put them back on. And we set the position again with the wrapped position. And then all that's left is to update the scores on the map. So we take all of the agents and put them into a geometry proximity node. And then we're going to sample on the map how close each point on the map is to an agent. Um, so we take the distance. Obviously, if they're... Um, if they're right on top of a point, then the distance to that point would be zero, but we actually want it to be hottest if they're right on top of a point, so we need to flip this around. So the way we do that is we pick the range that we want to be able to sample from. So here I arbitrarily decided that, that was 0 0.05, and we subtract the distance from that. So if, so if an agent is right on top of a point, it would be 0 0.05 so minus zero, so it's still 0 0.05. If, um, if, say, they're 0.06 away from it, then it would be negative 0.01, but we clamp it to stay in the 0 to 1 range, so anything further than 0.05 away falls off the scale. Then we simply add that value, which is the new scores based on how close a point is to an agent, and we add that to the blurred scores from the previous frame, and then the result of that is the scores for the next frame. Then once we've done that, all that's left to do is take the scores and pass that into a named attribute that we can use in a shader to draw those on our plane. And then we just set the material that I have set up to draw that value attribute. In the shader, all I'm really doing is um, running it through a color ramp to get these colors. And then I have a noise texture in here to add a little extra detail. If you look at the value directly, if you look at the value directly, you can see it's a little bit pixelated, sort of, because of the, pol the size of the polygons of the grid. And you can play with this and tweak it if you want it to look differently. So there you go. That's how this experiment works. Um, I think it's kind of cool and maybe useful for making some sort of texture or something. I don't really know. I definitely feel like I learned a few things, so that was my main goal. But the idea of having like a map that has values on it that you use to control how something moves around is kind of a cool idea and could maybe have a variety of different applications to it. Another thing I experimented with before this was using the shortest edge path to do like collision detection to create paths around objects. And that works pretty good too. And, is, and you can do like three dimensional paths of, um, avoiding some collision objects. So I thought that was kind of cool, and I might make a video about that in the future. Anyway, I'm going to put this blend file in its current state up on Gumroad, so feel free to download and experiment with it if you want. Um, other than that, I've got a bunch of other stuff, geometry nodes and things on Gumroad, so check those out if you haven't already. That's all I've got for this one. Thanks for watching.